So the other thing that we, uh, the key objectives or the key aspects of dam safety, we normally, the effort that we do with dam safety is normally related to the potential consequences of a dam. So if you have a small dam, you, and that doesn't really threaten anybody or anything, we're not going to put 100,000 or 1,000 monitoring uh, instruments in there and go and do daily inspections. But we're going to really, the, the high hazard dams, that uh, risk and hazard dams, we actually, go, one has to have the uh, appropriate effort for those. The other important thing is dam safety should be applied during the full life cycle. And, and um, it's the same with surveillance. So it, it, it already actually starts during investigations and design. People think dam safety and surveillance is something that only uh, starts once a dam has uh, been co uh, constructed and you operate it, it is, not the case. It starts already uh, during the initial stages of your dam as well. Then the other thing, one has to properly operate, maintain and do surveillance of the dam, including documentation of these processes. It is so important, but we'll, we will get to that. OK, the other thing and I that I normally just highlight to people is and I'm pretty sure it's the same in India. It's it's this is all over the world. The owner of the dam is responsible for the safety of the dam. So if anything happens in all systems, as far as my I know, it's the the owner of the dam, and that that's very important to understand. The owner includes the operator. Okay. So if something goes wrong, fingers always comes back and be pointed to whoever is the owner slash operator of the dam. So I grew up in a system um, who, who uh, introduced me to Ralf Peck, who was a, ge a very well-known geotechnical engineer from the United States. And he had, uh, he, he could summarize things in a few words that somebody like myself will take uh, a page or two to write. But one of these things that I grew up um, was there's no substitute for systematic and intelligent surveillance. OK, so each dam you actually and each situation you need to apply your mind. That's very important. You can't just have a, a code or a standard and apply the, the same concept for every dam because every dam is different and hopefully we will uh, uh, convince you guys um, going through this, why we're saying that. So if we actually look at the sort of the principles or the key component of surveillance, um, <clears throat> and yes, we, we use the surveillance term as a uh, sort of a, a, a bigger term grouping a number of things together. So we basically have four pillars of surveillance. All right. Some people will say three. Um, I like to actually say four, okay, because we have monitoring, but monitoring, we have manual monitoring and we have automatic monitoring. Okay, so monitoring is where you actually uh, have instrumentation that measure something for you. But whether if you have manual or if you have automated these distinct um, things that you have to give attention for those to actually be successful. Then we have visual inspections and visual inspections is a, a, a cornerstone of the surveillance. People don't understand that without visual inspections, you can, if you just do monitoring, you're not going to be as successful if you don't do a proper visual inspection program at your dam. Then the last one, which we call checking and testing, that normally uh, um, is about components like your gates, your electrical systems, all your mechanical systems, even your monitoring systems. It's to check and test it and make sure that these things actually work. So it's those components where you actually go out and you do, um, uh, yeah, as I say, checking and testing. All right. So 
I'm just showing you guys the slide again that I was talking about the need for considering risk. OK. So why why do we we actually use surveillance? All right, and, and how do we use surveillance? So the idea is we we do surveillance with these components that I've just actually talked about that um, that we see what's happening with the dam. And so if we if there's any sign of a failure mechanism that's busy developing, that hopefully that we will have sufficient time for an intervention that we actually prevent failure. That's really sort of the key point of surveillance that gives us actually the knowledge and information on that. So talking about knowledge, all right. We um, one of our old members of the uh, technical committee um, actually developed this concept uh, a few years ago. And if I can quickly, it's a it's a concept of developing knowledge. All right. So if one has to present it graphically like here, we build our knowledge as we go through the stages of the dam. So during planning, design, construction, if we if we record it properly, we will actually build knowledge on the dam. All right. And then during operation as well, hopefully we will gain we will gain knowledge as as we do uh, surveillance, we do monitoring, we do inspections. Now, I always tell the story here. Yeah, I work predominantly in Africa. I've seen it really in many, in many cases, big dams. A while ago, I was in Ethiopia and we did a, a, a safety evaluation of a big dam. It was five years after it was completed and we had great difficulty to actually access the information, the design and the construction information. It was really, really difficult to get it. Um, it was by it was. Yeah, it, I, I think if we didn't do it, then 10 years down the line, it would have been lost. So that is really one of the things is to make sure that we don't lose knowledge of the dam. But if one now looks at, at this, you guys can actually see here on the side. This was presenting only 30 years. So the next question that I would like to pose to you guys. All right. So what is a lifespan of the dam? So I'm going to, if you guys think about it, I'm pretty sure you guys think of the lifespan of the dam as normally the design lifespan. I, I'm not sure what you guys use in, in India, but typically in the world that I work, the design lifespan span of the dam is 50 to 100 years. OK, and so in, in unfortunately, in many cases, Designers have this idea that the dam will only be there for 50 years. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm saying this, but I'm a person that works in the later life of dams, if I can put it that way. That's my speciality. So if I can give you guys a few examples. So let's, uh, we've now thought about the, what's the lifespan of the dam. And uh, if I go to South Africa here, uh, one of our oldest dams, if you know South Africa, it's actually on top of Table Mountain. If you if you if you've seen a photo of Cape Town in South Africa, you will see there's a, a mountain behind it. And actually on top of this mountain is uh, a dam. All right. Woodhead Dam. And that was finished in 1897. So and, and I'm pretty sure you well, not just pretty sure. I'm I know you guys have much older dams in India. OK. But that's one of our oldest dams. So here we sit already with a dam that's been functioning for 120 years. Yes, we've we've done some uh, maintenance and rehabilitation work on the outlet, but the civil structure, as you guys can see there, pretty much still the original dam. All right. So it's 120 years, and and it would be really good if we knew what happened during those 120 years. Okay. If I go to the next one, so these are dams actually in Slovenia. They between three and four hundred years old. They were actually used in the industrial process, still functioning today. So, um, yeah, so the, these dams are three to four hundred years old. Then we go to some dams 
actually from from Spain. Manuel knows him pretty well. So this is Proserpina Dam, built by the Romans. OK, um, nearly 2000 years old and still functioning as a dam today. All right. Again, maintenance was done and some rehabilitation. I mean, you guys most probably did some work on the outlet works and things like that. But the civil structure basically is still as it was built by the Romans. And again, if we want to know whether it's still healthy, we actually need to know the whole, the, uh, the, the, how, it, how it behaved for 2000 years. All right. This is Canalvo Dam also in Spain. All right. Another example. So again, I'm coming back to our knowledge sort of uh, representation. So is it 30 years or should we be looking at 2000 years? OK, but the concept is just dams are going to to um, be there through generations. OK, not just one generation through multiple generations, and we must make an effort to actually collect information on the behavior of the dam throughout the lifespan of the dam to actually help the later generations to come to conclusions whether the dam is still safe or not. OK, the the last point that I wanted to make here uh, with regards to surveillance is the most important aspect of surveillance normally that we actually really focus on is change in behavior. And hopefully later today and to, especially tomorrow when we are looking at the real case histories, you guys will see why we say change of behavior. I always focus it on to say change of behavior. It's in visual inspections, monitoring, checking and testing. So if you if you do it and you see it's different from what you expected it to be, you know there's something going on. OK, thank you very much. Okay, excellent, Louis. Um, I, I shall just continue with um, uh, with um, a presentation on potential failure modes, and and I think we still have almost twenty five minutes. So I'll, I'll just take over from here, and then I believe we're having a a break for for lunch for an hour. Um, so I'll go, yeah, for 20, 25 minutes. Excellent. OK, so let me share my screen here. Mm -hmm. OK, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes. Excellent. So what I'll what I'll do now is focus on, on one key aspect of um, of dam dam surveillance, uh, which is the link of all of our tasks with uh, potential failure modes analysis. Because uh, just like Louis mentioned, what we want to do is, is uh, pinpoint uh, changes in behavior on the one hand and also try to foresee and um, beforehand uh, anticipate any issues any problems that we may encounter in in our dams um, so we all, when we're dealing with uh, dam safety and dam surveillance is is one of the key elements one of the pillars of, of uh, dam safety uh, we always have the, the standard spade based approach, which uh, is the one uh, using safety factors and the one which is uh, risk informed, which um, after the failures we had um, in 1966 of Teton Dam combined with the um, with the failures in the nuclear industry, in the uh, space industry, um engineers in general 
uh, we came to the conclusion that complex systems uh, oftentimes uh, fail because of combinations and interactions and um, and also dealing with uncertainty. So it's a it's an approach, a more holistic approach that tries to deal explicitly with uh, with uncertainty. And um, and also is, is a very useful approach when dealing with with uh, dam surveillance. Uh, you probably uh, you're probably aware of uh, the um, yeah, the, the dam safety uh, program that you have in India. Uh, so this is taken from one of uh, your guidelines, uh, which was done by my, my colleagues of, at the University of Valencia. I myself was part of uh, of the this research group uh, for a number of years when we started off uh, working on, on, on risk assessment. And, and you can see that uh, we're always trying uh, to, to, let's say, plan our tasks based on the uh, hazard potential classification of our dams. So we classify our dams in a certain way based usually on potential hazards and consequences uh, downstream. And then the, the pillars of dam safety, one of them is, is a surveillance, dam surveillance, monitoring, visual inspections, um, data records, and, and assessing dam behavior. Of course, this is very much linked with uh, O&M, operation and maintenance, and EAP, so emergency action planning is if, if something goes wrong. What the risk-informed approach does is really enhance and, um, and it intertwines with, uh, with, the, with the traditional pillars of, of dam safety. So it's really a technique and approach um, to deal with, uh, with uncertainty, which is what we don't know, um, and also to deal with variability, which is different. Um, so we always have variability. We're going to have uh, rainfall. Uh, we're going to have a um, combination of things that are going to be changing in a dynamic way. And we're going to have different types of, uh, of uncertainty. Um, so one of the, the hardest and the most difficult ones is this called epistemic uncertainty. We don't know exactly what's in the foundation even though what we have in the foundation is there. So it's it's really certain of the materials we have, the way um, they're behaving or interacting with our dam, that is certain, that is over there, even though we have a knowledge uh, limitation uh, for many things. So we don't know exactly how the, the concrete uh, is in, in certain parts of the dam, in, so, so risk assessment really tries to deal with that in, in a very explicit way. Um, also, when, when we talk about risk, uh, we're going to have uh, hazards and, and loads. Um, we're going to have the performance and the, how the dam, the dam system is uh, reacting. And then we're going to have consequences, exposure, uh, vul vulnerability and consequences. All of them are going to be a part of what's what can happen downstream, both in in in, ter in terms of loss of life and economic. So risk assessment is really, uh, in the one hand, identifying risks, and this is exactly where failure modes and potential failure modes analysis comes into place. Um, also li very much linked with uh, surveillance and visual inspections. So this is where we really uh, tackle and, and, and take the floor in the risk assessment arena. Uh, so dam surveillance is key to identify risks and also anticipate them. And essentially is what can go wrong, why, how, and when. Then risk analysis is really um, trying to, to uh, identify probabilities if we go for a quantitative approach, engineering judgment, consequence risk estimation, 
and eventually uh, assessing if that risk is tolerable or we have to implement uh, risk reduction measures. And, uh, and also how we control risks and, and investments and measures, how we do our operation and maintenance. Um, there are technical issues, but also a lot of legal, political, even public opinion. So it's a very complex issue, but uh, risk assessment um, helps us also to communicate things. And you can see that we're going to take advantage of uh, the dam safety files. So the technical files, the operation rules, safety reviews, um, the EAP. So this is very much linked with our, our risk model, which really breaks down loads, uh, the system response and the consequences. With uh, dam surveillance, um, we usually work a lot on the system response, so how the dam and the, the foundation is behaving, but also within the monitoring system, we also account for, for loads and even what's happening upstream and downstream of our dam, because we can really include, and, and, and the dam surveillance uh, system really encompasses also what's what's happening in, in the basin and downstream. And we have different ways of uh, representing risk, um, like risk profiling based on, on likelihoods and, and consequences. Um, we can also, when we go for a quantitative approach, risk and cost and, and see how uh, efficient is our our, our, our measures, our risk reduction measures. We can also use this risk informed approach for security. So it's really uh, human based and um, actions, vandalism, uh, terrorism. Um, so really, uh, um, in this case, malevolent actions uh, against our dams, we can also take advantage of, of the risk informed approach. And of course, this is also part of a dam surveillance system. And especially if you have an automated um, dam surveillance system, the, the cameras, the warnings and alarms are also integrated in, in the dam surveillance system. And uh, oftentimes we're going to go for the residual risk um, uh, which is really what happens if the dam did not did not exist, what happens downstream and what happens if the dam fails. And there's a residual risk and also residual risk in the in, in the sense of if we implement uh, measures, um, we're, we're not always going to um, um, approach and reach this zero risk uh, situation. So we have to manage that residual risk. And dam surveillance is comes in handy. It's very useful uh, when we want to manage this residual risk that we have. Because we know we can never get to this zero risk. And um, just a, a, a very short briefing on what a potential failure modes analysis looks like. Uh, so this is a session where you can see there's a group of people. Uh, we can have structural engineers, mechanical engineers. We can have the dam operator. We can have the, the dam regulator. We can have the consultants, the dam designer. If um, it's, a, it's a newer dam and, and, and it's still alive. And essentially the whole team, engineers and technicians, and thinking about ways um, with which, in which the dam can fail, in, in which something can go wrong. And uh, so this is broken down in, in, in the mechanism, um, it's depicted, and everything is, uh, we have minutes, so every, everything is reported. And um, so, essentially we assess what can happen to go wrong. So it's it's 
it's really the failure mode, uh, which is anything that can make the dam not perform as expected and, and, and do its duty, either if it's hydropower, irrigation, water supply, um, and then the failure mechanisms. The mechanism is really the chain of, event, of events, the sequence of events that can result in a, in a failure. So the important thing about breaking down uh, failure modes into different mechanisms is that uh, number one thing, we can detect deficiencies. Uh, we can um, implement partial measures and, and we can define surveillance needs. And essentially, uh, dam surveillance can, can help us to identify a, a failure mode and a failure mechanism that is going on, that it's actually happening at a certain stage. So if we tackle this uh, failure mechanism in a certain stage, thanks to our dam surveillance tasks, we can stop that from happening and we can prevent the dam for from getting to the uh, to failure. Uh, also, one important thing is, uh, of course, the field, field inspections and the issue with information. Um, what uh, really uh, nurtures uh, potential failure modes analysis is really the data and the information we have about the dam. Um, so it's very important to go in depth with uh, all geological and, um, and geotechnical um, information about the dam, analyze, analyzing all the monitoring and operation records, the data, the pictures from the visual inspections, uh, any report from the past, um, the um, monitoring reports that annually we carry out behavior, safety issues reports, along with operation rules, EAP, the dam design and everything. Uh, another important idea is to never, never rely and never trust as built drawings. So always think about uh, some kind of uh, campaign and survey campaign to really make sure if, if, if the core of our embankment is finishing our certain elevation or not, if uh, we have a specific uh, uh, material in one area or another, and relying on as-built drones can be dangerous because uh, oftentimes it's not reality. So in, 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 in this realm of uh, dam safety, uh, risk-informed uh, approaches, um, surveillance and monitoring, which is one one part of surveillance, is monitoring. Well, th they're key in diagnosing and, and anticipating any issues. Uh, surveillance is going to help us to establish and really update um, thresholds. So monitoring and, and uh, emergency thresholds. And many of these thresholds May can be based on data, like a piezometer going beyond a certain pore pressure, um, a pendulum going beyond a certain displacement, but also visual inspections. Many of these thresholds can be a visual inspection description, like if you find sippage and it goes from a humidity to uh, an actual a sippage, that you can gauge, you can uh, measure. Well, that that is a threshold that you can really define when defining uh, EAP thresholds to really trigger the uh, emergency action plan. And um, and also is very important in, in preventive detection. So just one quick example. Let's say we have this gravity dam. Uh, we know this dam is uh, founded on on limestone with karsts. So during the, the construction, we find this picture and we can see karst caves and sinkholes in the foundation. Then we go to the monitoring data and 
we even find that some pisometers are going beyond the, uh, the, the theoretical uh, uplift laws. Uh, this happens when you have a, a, a lateral flow coming from the mountain. So you have your dam, the foundation, then, but the, then the dam can be in a valley. And if, if the, uh, the foundation of the dam is really getting water uh, from the mountain with, uh, with a higher piezometric level, our piezometers essentially are energy level measuring devices. So we can have uh, pore pressures that go beyond the pool level. If we have water coming from, from the margins from the mountain and really feeding our foundation. So we can, have, we can find this trend uh, in, in our piezometers. And then if we have a model, a numerical model, we can cope with the um, with the monitoring data, so we we have a hybrid model. Well, we can assess, and uh, this way we can name this uh, failure mode, which is not just instability or sliding in the in the contact between the dam and the foundation, but we can really specify in which block this could happen, because the dam is is a large dam. We have different blocks, so when we name a failure mode is important uh, to specify which block at which elevation. Um, and then you can see we, we it could be longer, but a like a, a simplified summary version of the failure mode is that uh, failure by instability in a specific block accounting for the geology we have in the foundation, limestone and quartz, uh, the uplift pressures that we are recording with the piezometers, and uh, and we define also the the low scenario. So we can have a failure mode uh, with a sunny day event. So during normal operation of the reservoir, we can have the failure mode developing in a seismic event, or we can have the the failure mode develop developing in a flood event, and things are going to be different. The probably the means, the resources, uh, the the time we're going to have to anticipate the failure mode is going to be different. So the mechanism, maybe we have the same failure mode instability, but the mechanism, the chain of events is going to be different, whether we are in a normal operation scenario or we are in a seismic uh, event scenario or a flood one. And what we're going to do once we have we are eliciting a naming our failure modes, we're going to link uh, part of our surveillance tasks uh, to this failure mode. So our surveillance system is specifically going to tackle and try and, and identify this specific failure mode. So we're going to give a reasoning behind why we read this piezometer, why we measure the pendulum, why we do the leveling at the crest, why we carry out the geodetic campaigns, why we measure the joint displacement uh, in between joints in this gravity dam, and why and what to look for in our, during in our visual inspections. Even we can define research and study needs derived from this failure mode because maybe we, all we have is, is this picture from the foundation. So maybe we can do some geophysics or maybe some uh, new boreholes down, even if it's downstream or from the gallery to gain information. Uh, so we can define that. We can also uh, decide if based on this failure mode and the information we have, if some urgent, really fast and uh, right of the bat action needs to be um, taken. And also we can relate our failure modes to the operation rules and the uh, EAP and the emergency action plan and we can update 
of this safety document um, thanks to our PFMA. So this is really the power of, of potential failure modes. And what we, we what we try and do is define the initiation, the beginning of the failure mechanism, uh, how that is uh, the pr progression, the step-by-step -step mechanism we mentioned from the beginning to the to the bridge of uh, and release of water, and then the impacts, the consequences. So to to uh, to finish this um, uh, before we have this uh, the lunch break uh, and then after after the lunch break we'll go into the potential failure modes in in normal operation seismic and flood scenarios let's go briefly over the the features uh, what defines our our concrete and masonry dams because louis afterwards louis will talk about embankment earth dams but uh, we'll begin with concrete and masonry dams so the, the the key thing with concrete and masonry dams, um, as opposed to embankment dams, it's really resistance to external external erosion. So if we have some overtopping, some water flowing over the crest of the dam, uh, the dam does not necessarily uh, have to fail. So concrete and masonry masonry dams, they have some resistance to overtop it for a certain amount of time and with a certain um, uh, amount of, um, of overtopping, obviously. But uh, also one important thing is with, with concrete, we have this glue, cement, ash, um, uh, and, um, and this uh, cementitious components that are going to glue the gravel and the, the the materials that make up concrete, and that is quite resistant to internal erosion. So both are the resistance uh, against internal erosion and and this external erosion that we have with overtopping, uh, this is one one clear advantage of concrete and masonry masonry dams as opposed to to earth dams. Uh, but even uh, in this, uh, despite this, we're going to have safety issues. Mm, they're usually related to cracking, uh, structural um, issues or, or flaws that we can have. Obviously, the foundation is key. And then weathering uh, an evolution of, of the components, the aggregates of the dam and the cementitious materials. Um, Within the um, uh, the failure modes, it's important to see how the dam, the, these concrete and masonry dams, are going to perform because the, the the structural mechanisms are very different. So a gravity dam is going to be working mainly because of friction uh, in the foundation and, and the weight. Uh, a buttress dam is going to concentrate uh, all the stresses and and forces in, in in the buttresses. And then arch dams, especially, are going to have a very 3D uh, mechanism. And, and their be behavior, it's going to have arches, uh, horizontal arches, um, transferring the efforts uh, to the valley, to the margins, to the abutments, but then also vertical arches that are going to uh, transfer the loads to the foundation in different ways, in a very hyperstatic static um, in manner. And how do uh, concrete and masonry dams fail? Well, essentially, you can see that more than half the dams failed because of the foundation. And this is the old statistics, which um, have been recently updated. But uh, many of the failures have to do with the, with the foundation. Even though historically we talk about overtopping um, in, uh, in concrete and masonry dams, but overtopping is really a symptom. The water is flowing over the dam, the crest of the dam. But overtopping by itself 
is not a failure mode. Overtop it is going to uh, over branch in, in different things. Because of overtopping, we're going to have scouring, um, erosion of the toe. We're going to have over stresses. Um, we're going to have erosion of, of the, the damn materials. So certain things are going to be happening. And the combination of all of them eventually can make the dam breach and fail. But uh, overtopping by itself is just a symptom. It's just one part of the failure mechanism. Uh, so you can see the, the subtle differences between the standards based approach and, and, and really the risk informed um, approach. Um, apart from that, from that uh, yeah, spillways and, and spillway gates uh, also is an important thing. And, um, and in general, seismic related failures are very, very rare, especially in concrete and masonry dams. They behave quite well um, with uh, seismic events. And we're going to have many different types of failures. ICOL bulletins give us a long list of, of uh, potential issues and, and symptoms and things to look for. But essentially, as you can see, uh, foundation uh, flaws and issues, then body uh, materials, the structural mechanism and behavior of the dam. Also, the auxiliary um, uh, ancillary equipment and infrastructure of the dam. And always, always a combination of the above. So failure modes, it's going to be a chain of events combining and interacting. And it's always um, not just one failure mode or one failure mechanism, but a combination of different mechanisms is usually what yields uh, to uh, a dam failure. And, and finally, to, to wrap up this introduction, uh, what is the, the role of surveillance, inspection and, and monitoring? Well, uh, during extreme uh, events, it's very difficult, if, if, especially if it's a seismic event, for instance, it's very only a few seconds. If we have a, a flood event, well, in some cases we can have a flood event during for a week or for several days um, with incoming flows, inflows in, in our reservoir. So we may have more time uh, to inspect and to even measure. But always um, intensive monitoring and surveillance is always carried out after a, an extreme hydrological or seismic event. And it, with concrete and masonry dams, we're going to look for uh, what's going on in, in, in the galleries. Um, the galleries oftentimes uh, give us access to the abutment and the foundation, or we can always go to the toe of the dam and, and look for that contact between the, the dam body and the foundation downstream. So the, the abutment and the foundation areas, we're going to look for um, a seepage and leaks, but uh, breaking it down, is it coming from the foundation? Is it coming from the dam body drainage system? Is it coming from one margin from the other is the sippage connecting one gallery with it with the other one how is that relating with what we have in the foundation also uplift pressures is important in in concrete and masonry dams it's not as critical as a magma dams but it can be important as well uh, of course this is more important with gravity uh, with gravity dams arch dams can also play a role, even though uplift pressures in in a, an arch dam are not as critical, even though we have drainage in both in the foundation and the dam body as well. Also the contacts, the interfaces um, among different materials and areas of our of the dam. And of course, um, the uh, the traffic light in, in, in many cases in with uh, concrete and masonry dams are displacements. 
So mm, pendulums, leveling, joint, um, ammeters. Um, how is that mm, displacements we have and differential movements between one block and another? This is going to be very important in this type of dams. And the basic rules uh, when when we do also visual inspections, because visual inspections are the number one thing in dam surveillance. So dam surveillance encompasses monitoring, so reading with and, and using sensors and um, and carrying out campaigns, geodetic campaigns, or maybe nowadays INSAR, uh, laser, 3D laser scanning, um, geophysical campaigns, obviously topography and geodetic campaigns, and measuring in, in essence, that's monitoring. But visual inspections come first, and visual inspections are, are even more powerful than monitoring. And also uh, recording all that data, pictures and reports and, and checklists from, from our visual inspections and recording the data is also a, a key element of, of, of dam surveillance. And then the uh, uh, also the um, hydraulic uh, elements, so spillway, pool level, uh, outlet works and, and water intakes um, is also an important part of, of the dam surveillance system and, and the dam surveillance um, realm. But if we go to the number one part of dam surveillance, which is visual inspections, what we want to what we want to do is sketch, make a drawing, make a, um, a really a figure of what we see, the issue we are we are addressing. Uh, try to measure. We can measure um, with uh, with a ruler, with a bucket, with a, a watch. Uh, we can measure with our monitoring system, of course. If we can use a piezometer, a pendulum, whatever, but always measure and link the flow we've identified with uh, some kind of type of measurement. Obviously, photographs and pictures and, and the exact location. So these are like the basic rules to be applied when we do a visual inspections. And uh, I think we've gone a little bit beyond uh, uh, the time we had, uh, eight, nine minutes. Uh, sorry for that. And uh, But I believe uh, we, we can have now a, a, a break for lunch, um, if, if I remember right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luis and Dr. Mandrel for making an excellent detailed presentation. We will now take a break for lunch and reassemble at 1400 hours. OK. So in so we get together like in 50, 55 minutes. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. Yes, yes. OK. Excellent. Thank you. Well, then see, see, see you. you. See, see you, you after then. the break. See okay. you after the break. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>